Hello world, Blue Dolphin here with the Hoplite Security Channel. We're back with another Hack the Box Machine. Let's get into it. Hello world, I'm Blue Dolphin with the Hoplite Security Channel. And today we're getting into another Hack the Box Machine. This is the medium difficulty undetected machine. So what does this machine look like? Well, from a summary, we start off with enumerating the website and we get a CV for foothold. Then to get user, we learn about a backup folder with some credentials that we have to decode and crack a hash. Then for root, we do binary analysis and exfiltrate and reverse engineer a payload. Now, starting from the top, from the beginning, we do some enumeration. We find two ports, a very narrow attack surface. And in order to get that initial foothold, we jump into subdomain enumeration, directory discovery, we find a PHP CVE that we ultimately execute for command ejection, and then a bash reverse shell. From here, we're on the machine and we start to enumerate internally where we find a backup folder that we review and we're able to extract some strings from a file that we decode in CyberChef and find out it's a hash that we then crack for a password as user Steven. From here, we pivot to root by doing internal enumeration, finding note about some mail that points us to look at the Apache 2 service where we review a mod and we exfiltrate that mod, do some binary analysis and reverse engineer the password. Let's get into it. Jump right into things here. We're going to start off with an nmap scan against our target 10.129.82.170. Well, we're off to a bad start here. Nmap scans aren't working, so let's go ahead and just browse on over to the website and see if there even is a website. Sure enough, there is. We have Diana's Jewelry. So this is a nice looking site. Initially, we just want to look for anything that's interactive. We're going to want to fire up Directory Buster in the background here. We have comments down in the bottom. And what we're looking for here is anything that's interactive. We're going to let us play around with the website. They have a learn more option, which does nothing. It just depends news up here. We have visit store and you can see visit store provides us with a subdomain store.jewelry.htb. So let's go ahead and add this to our Etsy host file. And we'll do sudo nano Etsy hosts. Add our target IP here, and this is going to be store dot d jewelry. Oh no, I got it wrong. Jewelry dot htb, and let's refresh this page. And with any luck, we should have something here. Uh, looks like the page loaded again, I guess. But the only difference is there's no learn more and visit. There's just the read more. So we'll we'll click that. It doesn't do anything. It, uh, I guess let's click through all of these, look for another subdomain. We've Oh, so we have a script here, products.php being run. I guess that's being used for all their products, obviously, and all the links here. So there's nothing really there. We have a newsletter email address. We could go chase that down. Probably not going to go anywhere. We do have an email contact at DJ Jewelry, uh, a actual location in New York. That's interesting. Uh, phone number. So there's a login, so you know we could try logging in here, but I think we're going to want to get something running in the background to help with this, such as directory buster and or auto recon, although I'm not sure auto recon is the best at this point. So let's go ahead and start directory buster in the background. So you can see the options that I've chosen here is 100 threads, a list based brute force with the directory list medium text. Then I've taken off recursive and we're just going to be looking for directories and files and files that start with PHP, which I'm sure there'll be a lot of. So let's actually get rid of that just to start. We're gonna run this here and hope we get something good. Looks like we have found some directories here, including a vendor. Unfortunately, my recursive option uh, didn't listen to my settings and it's running, but that's fine. We found this vendor directory. So let's go ahead and take a look at vendor. Okay, so we can see that we have a PHP script. We have access to all these documents in the back end here. So this is really interesting. This is gonna conclude phase one though. And I'll see everyone in phase two where we're going to get in the initial foothold stage.
jumping right into phase two here, what this is gonna look like is we're going to explore this directory here. Then we're gonna start looking up CVEs for all the modules that we see. And we are then going to find that there is a convenient CVE for PHP unit. And from there, we're gonna research it and exploit it. It's gonna be command injection. And then we're going to create a reverse shell. Looking in this directory, you can see that we have this auto load PHP, which at first seems interesting, but there's nothing there. So we start clicking through here and we have a lot going on to explore. So how do we figure out what's vulnerable? Well, what we can do is just keep it simple, open up another tab and start just start looking into this. So we can say composer CVE and just see what comes up here. Looks like we already have vulnerabilities. And what we wanna look for are simple ones that are easy to test. We're reading this here and we see that there is a vulnerability. I don't quite understand it. And so there is considerable information disclosure. I don't see anything about how to activate this or chase it down. And we can come back and dig into this. Oh, you know what? I'm going to take a look at the tenable synopsis. Okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna move on to the next one here. So now we have something called Doctrine. I don't even know what that is, but let's look it up. Let's go Doctrine CVE. Looks like there's a, again a list and I see SQL, execute code, execute code, SQL. And the execute code one is from 2016. And let's see if there's an easy way we can test for this just to confirm if there's anything there or not. So this does look attractive. Let's just take a quick look for this online and we'll just copy and paste the CVE. And then I usually like to search these up in GitHub. And if I don't see any payloads pretty quickly, then I usually move on. Let's take a look here. You can see that this was reported and We are then sent to another article to read about this. All right, there's an, a, an FAQ, I think, about am I vulnerable? We could check this by calling echo umask from both the shell and your web server. Well, we're not gonna be able to do that. Let's move on to the next one. So then we have my clabs. I don't even know what that is, but again, we're gonna check. My clabs CVE. And you can see that, yeah, there is something here. Vulnerability 2017-9841. What's this except? This looks like it's a security breach for my clabs, I guess. And what we can do is run PHP code on a fallible website. Oh, and it looks like Composer is actually needed for this and a vulnerable PHP unit, which we do have down here. So I'm confused then what's vulnerable. Is it my clubs or is it install a vulnerable PHP unit version using Composer? So this is interesting. Let's take a look. Let's dive into this a little more. Let's copy the CVE and just look it up on GitHub to see if we can just get the simple overview. We don't want to spend forever learning how it works. We just kind of want to get in and get out. Okay, so I'm seeing some stuff on GitHub. Let's take a quick look just to see if there's like a simple way to test this without having to invest a large amount of time. This looks too complicated. I don't want to install this custom script and test it. I will, but ideally there's something a little simpler that we can test with. Looks like someone has posted a PHP unit proof of concept for this vulnerability. Let's try it. 
And what, let's take a look at what this is. This is a curl data PHP echo pi command. It's weird. And then the URL. But what's more important is the directory there, which is vendor, which we have PHP unit. Okay, yes, we do have PHP unit and vendor. And then we have to navigate to the PHP directory. This is good if we can get to the absolute path. I think we'll have a chance. We'll take a look at source. Util PHP evaluate. This is looking good. Okay, so we do have the eval standard in .php. That's wonderful. Let's try this out here. I guess we don't need to copy the whole string. We can just copy. Actually, that's probably going to be easiest. I'll paste this string in and just replace this with our target, which is going to be not localhost. I have no idea what it just did. I wonder, let me get rid of our, um, wait a sec. Oh, I know what I did wrong. I have to put in our fully qualified domain name. So that was going to be store. Right, store dot DJ. Oh, I guess D for Diana. Diana jewelry. Dot HTB, I think. There we go. Okay, so it looks like it did in fact evaluate. Oh, I know why we use the pi command because it's evaluating it. So in this case, it did evaluate pi. Now we need to turn this into command injection. So if we replace pi with ID, I, I don't think that's going to work. We'll try. Doubt it. Didn't work. So what we can try is just term is using a string terminator and padding another command, which that worked. We use a string terminator, passed ID, and we're in. Okay, so now we need to get a reverse shell. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to need to look around for different reverse shells and we're going to start with a bash one and see if this works so let's go a bash reverse shell just because we know that everything we're passing is going to a command line and let's just try a simple bash tcp shell here and we'll see we'll see if this is going to work and cut the cake we'll go ahead and fire up a listener we'll do net cats First, I'll create that directory for our target machine, which is in, uh, it's going to be undet. Oh, got my spelling wrong. Undetected. Jump in there, and now we will spin up a listener. So we'll just do netcat dash nlvp six three six three. We're listening. Now we'll head on over to our reverse shell page here. Copy this. Jump over to our command line and give this another shot. Oh, whoops. And we're going to have to add our reverse shell. However, we're going to have to do it at the start here, where we have, of course, our system command to pass. And the way we're going to do this is I believe we're just going to Hmm. We're going to call system. So we'll do PHP system. And then this will be tricky because we have to call bash first from the command line. I think we'll do this with the bash taxi. Then we can do a single. And then I believe we, from here we can paste and we'll just need one set of parentheses. So if we paste this in, we would then close it here, and then we'd have to close it a second time. Is that right? Something doesn't seem right here. Let's just put in my IP address first to get this sorted. Okay, so we have PHP system, and then we're calling bash, then we're calling bash again, and we want to close this off, but it won't quite let us. 
let me just try sending this. I don't think this is going to work. Yeah, I didn't think it would work. Something's not right here. Hmm. Okay, so we have to play around with the syntax to get this initial bash command properly highlighted, I believe, because we don't see highlighting here. So it makes me think that something... Oh, well, I put a backslash in for character escaping. No, now we have a parse error. So then I think, oh, you know what? I wonder if we have to escape the double quotes. Uh, maybe not. I think it's just going to crash. Oh, there we go. Oh, perfect. We're in. Oh, I'm missing on the camera. All right, I'm back. Not sure how long that was going on for. But yes, we made it. Initial foothold. All right, so that concludes this phase here. This was phase two. Now we're going to jump into phase three, where we're going to be dealing with escalating to user access. See everyone in the next phase. Jumping right into phase three here, we're gonna be starting off by doing some manual enumeration and we're gonna notice a suspicious binary in the var dub 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 folder. From here, we're going to cat that file. There's a string, we extract it, we decode it in Cyberchef, we find a hash, we crack the hash, we have a password, and we log in as user. So jumping right into things here, we are of course on the machine. And the first thing we wanna know is who's on this box? Who else is here with us? And let me just clean my windows up here to reduce any confusion. Close all of this. And the way we're gonna do this is just by looking at the Etsy host file. We don't need to be in this detailed subdirectory. So let's go ahead and do cat. Let's see, hosts. Well, that doesn't make sense. I have to do Etsy password. Oh, silly me. Okay. Oops, I think I accidentally took a screenshot. All right. There's a way to do the cat root directory. What is it? I'm, I need to get better. I'm pretty lazy sometimes. Etsy password. No such file. Cat Etsy password? Maybe? Oh yeah, there we go. I just go right to it. Uh, okay, so looks like we have um, a user Steven, a user Steven one, and yeah, that's odd. All right, let's take a look in the var dub 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 folder to see if there's anything else in here that can kind of stand out to us. And initially, we don't see anything. Let's drop into var, see what we find. And we see a backup folder, which is always fantastic when there's actually something there taking a look you can see we have extended states and that's it looking at all permission we have execution permission on a binary file or text file what is it looks like it's a binary okay so something we could do here for example would be we probably don't have gdb on this system so just starting small we will just run strings let's just run head on the command and see what is this binary and is it relevant to us we don't see much in the header at the top there, so let's just try tail. And we see that, yep, there's several functions, some calls to libc, get root payload close, root data, not really seeing a whole lot here. Let's just run, let's start running strings on this binary. Otherwise we can download it and use some fantastic tools to help analyze it. Let's run cat. Again, not really seeing anything, but let's just take a little scroll up. We do see something about uh, checking if we got root, what went wrong. And it looks like we have a substring in D message. Okay, cool. So we have bin bash and then this command that's encoded. Let's copy this, jump over to Cyberchef. Input our information here and see what we get. So this is hexadecimal and we got nothing. 
So sometimes in these scenarios, I just like to kind of cut away at the text to see if maybe there is just some bad character somewhere at the end or at the start. And you can see that, yes, there was actually, we have something here. We have, so what happened? Let's do, let's undo what I did. All I did was delete this start. This, oh, oh, I wonder, I think, yeah, so bash dash C. So here the taxi was just um, bash calling our encoded command. So I think we actually just want to repaste everything, delete the C. There we go. So it looks like a command was run. Wget temp files, authorized keys, output, authorized keys, get temp files, change permissions. So this looks hard. Uh, something into cron tab. Oh, I see a password hash. This is nice. I like this. Into Etsy. Okay, let's copy the password hash. Now I'm not sure. I think the password hash will end right here. I'm not too sure. Let's, we can use hash identifier actually to check. So we will, let me get off this target for a second and let's go nano hash.txt. Input this, I think. Yeah, let's just run it, see what happens. And we'll go hash ID hash.txt. And it says unknown hash, end of file. So one thing I noticed is that we have a backslash by the start. Let's, looks like we have an, oh, we have another backslash by this dollar sign. Don't think you're supposed to have backslashes. Let's just try this again. I'm pretty sure you're not. No, it didn't work. Let's get rid of this one. There's probably more. I've seen this before. I think there was something similar to this on the OSCP where I had a hash, but I had to remove some type of like escape character or I had to append a character or something like that. And it was just testing my ability to know what a password hash looks like and how it's formatted. Okay, it looks like this worked. It's SHA-512. So we can literally just run John hash. And then I think this will work. Oh, wow. Okay, well that was insane how quickly it cracked the hash. I literally just, it wasn't working, so I did a sudo john hash.txt and it loaded the password and then right away said no passwords left. So then I did tac tac show, which if you don't know is how you see what was um, kind of cracked uh, in within john and it looks like it says I hate hackers. So let's see if this is too good to be true or not. So let's do ssh steven at 10.129.82.170. And we'll do I hate tackers and it didn't work. So let's try that SSHD user. I hate packers. That didn't work. Let's, oh, Steven one. Let's try Steven one. I hate hackers. Oh, there we go. We're in. Boom. Look at that. All right. Well, that concludes phase three of this engagement. And the next phase, we'll be jumping into phase four, where we'll be escalating to user, from user to root. See everyone in the final phase. Jumping into the final phase here, we're going to be doing some new internal enumeration with LinPs, where we're going to find a interesting file in var mail, and it's an internal note. We read that note. And we learned that there's some issues and some strange, behavior, strange behaviors with the Apache service. From here, we do some investigating and we find that the module file or, the, or one of them was recently updated compared to all the other ones. And we take a look at it just by outputting the strings and we find an encoded string, which we decode and it's a user command, which points us over to an SSHD binary which we download, decompile, and actually extract a password from it in a, a bit of a interesting way. So let's just jump right into it. We're gonna start off with some internal enumeration. I'm going to be downloading WinPs in the temp folder here. I guess the first thing we can do is actually do sudo l to see if there's like an easy low hanging fruit 
way to escalate to root. Um, apparently my password's not working. I'm not even sure what to make of that. Let's go to the uh, temp folder. That's weird. There's no such folder, so we need to go back a few more directories. There we go, we're in temp, now let's do wget http, and of course I've already spun up the Python listener on my local machine. We will do ip10, so local machine 10 14 14 over port 8000 as usual, slash linps.sh, then we will need to change permissions on linps.sh, I'm just going to blow the permissions away, obviously not best practice. Now I'm going to run linps.sh, and this is fantastic because we will get the color coding uh permissions denied oh it's because chmod didn't work i was moving too quick there here we go linpeas.sh awesome now we're gonna run linpeas.sh wonderful and we'll go through this bit by bit as it outputs information of course basic information it tells us we are steven Thought we were Steven one. That's odd. You can see we already have a CV that we're vulnerable to. So let's take a quick peek at this CVE, figure out what's going on here. This is a local privilege escalation vulnerability using pool kit. So what we'll do is we'll take this CVE and go to GitHub to get an idea for how we would execute it. And you can see that, well, if, so in this POC on GitHub, you get the shell immediately. We compile and then we target modules, update a directory and path. Interesting. I'm not quite sure what to make of that. It looks like to not execute the shell. I don't actually know anything about this. I'm just kind of reading how it's being executed to get an idea for how much effort is this really gonna take? And is this gonna be the best use of our time? But I am I'm not really liking this. We can definitely dig into this, but let's see what else there is. Unmounted file system, nothing there. Looks like we're seeing some more exploit suggestions from the Linux exploit suggester, including PwnKit. Looking through the results here, we can see that there is some information highlighting Apache 2. We can see that there's a process with credentials in memory, root required. And we have Apache 2 and SSHD. This is interesting. Apache 2, I can see, SSHD. I'm not sure actually, let's just look at what is SSHD binary. So it's the open SSH, is that normal? Password in memory. Decrypting open SSH passwords. Because what if there's just default credentials and it's an example? Hmm, that's odd. Okay, well, let's keep looking through here. We can see that we have Farlib main, nothing special. So we'll keep going through all this not really seeing anything yet. We have port 53 running locally, so that would be for DNS. We have obviously Steven1 is logged in. Continuing to make our way through this. So we're nearing the end of Looks like Steven has a mailbox, var mail Steven. Okay, well, let's check that out too. Then we have 
tables inside readable SQL databases. Nothing special there. Backup files. Not seeing anything. Maybe. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, the mail folder. So where was that? That was, was it, I think it was var mail? No, it wasn't var mail because Steven is, oh, I guess this was the mail. Oh, this is the mail. Okay, so it's from root. It's to Steven and it says, Subject investigations, I like this. Hi, Steven. We recently updated the system but are still experiencing some strange behaviors with the Apache service. Well, we did see passwords in the Apache service. We have temporarily moved the web store and database to another server whilst investigations are underway. If for any reason you need access to the database or web application code, get in touch with Mark. He'll generate a temporary password for you to authenticate to the temporary server. So maybe we have to forge some mail to Mark. I doubt it. What I want to know more about is the temporary location for the web store and database to another server. Hmm. Let's jump over to the Apache, but we don't want to go. So the default location is, I'm just looking, let me just look it up here. It looks like Etsy, um, let's just go locate Apache too. Can't use locate. Oh, that's not ideal. Okay. Maybe we can do find. Oh, spelled find wrong. Nothing. That's odd. Which? Says user Espen, but then I'm reading online the root directory or configurations are in uh, Etsy Apache 2. But I, hmm, I think I'm confusing myself here. So where would we start? Well, let's take a look at sites enabled. Let's see. Sites enabled, sounds juicy. And there's really, I don't think we're gonna find anything here. Log, oh, so there is an error log. Let's actually take a look at, yeah, let's definitely take a look at the error log. I'm just trying to, let me look up where the Apache 2 error log is. Apache 2 error log. Var log Apache 2 errors. All right, let's go back. Var log Apache. Oh, spelled that wrong. Var log. Where am I here? Oh, I'm in home, Stephen. Okay, so we gotta go back a bit. Now we can jump over to var log and Apache 2. Brilliant. Oh, permission denied. So we can't view the error log. That's not very helpful. Let's, uh, okay, fine, I guess. Let's look at the syslog. No, I can't look at anything here. Okay then, I guess. I mean, we're obviously not a part of the syslog group yeah no okay well i guess that's fine let's go to that's quite unfortunate let's go over back to apache 2 the etsy files and let's I just want to take a look at the magic no that's the mic magic file what's the magic file this is microsoft outlook that sounds juicy this is a lot of information Poof. Not too sure this is gonna go anywhere. Okay, no, I doubt it. Let's clear this. Let's take a look at 
environment variables. Otherwise, I think we're going to have to dig into. Yeah, I don't think this is. I don't think this is the path. Let's take a look at Apache 2 config, but I doubt this is going to be anything. Require all deleted. Log formats. Oh, yes, yeah, so you can see that log formats. Yep. Oh, too bad. I don't have access to them, anyways. Okay, let's take a look at the mod business. What do we got going on here? Mods available, mods enabled. Let's look at mods enabled. There are an absolute ton of mods. So it looks like they're all set up on July 4th, 5th, and then there's one that's May 17th, and this is reader.load. Let's actually take a peek at this. Mods available, reader.load. Mods, interesting. Let's cat reader.load. Interesting, okay, let's strings reader dot. Cat, wait, why are we doing reader dot load? Oh yes, because that was the most recent one. Reader dot load. Interesting. I'm just gonna do some research on this. Not too familiar with reader.load. Okay, so what's interesting here is when we look at the reader.load file, which is literally just nothing but a property that contains an event handler in a sense. So the uh, it's just a function being called from the shared library and it looks like the reader.load actually calls the mod underscore reader dot so. So we could try running strings on this as well as the reader underscore module. It looks like we have to go to user lib Apache 2 modules to get there. So we'll browse over there. Okay, we are here in the user lib Apache 2 modules file. So let's take a look at mod reader.so. Uh, that was just a whole lot of information, which, okay, fair enough. Let's just quickly look for any strings, large strings we can extract. Not really, so I'm actually gonna, we'll just run strings on it. And we'll do mod reader.so. Oh, right, there is no, we actually can't, um, darn it. Okay, let's, let's see. If we just scroll up even just for a little bit, maybe we'll get lucky, find some characters. I do see CMOD reader. This looks good, actually. Reader bin bash command. Yep, CMOD reader dot C. We definitely want this. This looks good. Let's take a look in CyberChef, pop it in. I don't think it's loading. Let's try this again. So this is hexadecimal. Wait a sec. Yeah. Oh, I think we have to delete the C here. Like in the last string we had, we have to delete the, the, uh, wait a sec. This isn't hex. What am I doing? This is all these hex is A to F zero to nine. So this is base 64. Oh, there we go. Okay. Look at this. W get share files. User bin, ah, uh, we did see SSHD had a password in it from LinPs. Remember earlier? Boom, let's go take a look. I bet we just have to find the password in this. So let's go, okay, let's get over there. This is great. User, sbin, ss, yeah, let's just cat the SSHD binary for up. Oh, okay. Oh no, oh no. This is, we're just not gonna be able to, we're not gonna be able to do this. So let's, uh, Oh, great. All right, let's download this file here. So how we'll do that is let's use netcat and I believe we'll do this by, there's a cat just behind my head on my chair. 
So the way we'll do this, I think, is going to be netcat dash nlvp. We'll just do one, two, three, four. And I think we do output sshd. No, not quite, which is interesting. I really thought we would just do netcat nl. Oh, I think I have to go the well, wait, wait a sec. There we go, okay. So now that we're listening for a file named sshd, we can come over here and we can go netcat, and then I believe it's gonna be, I think we could just, I think we just do 10.10.14.14, uh, obviously port one, two, three, four. And we'll output sshd. Fortunately, it does say permission denied. Uh, hang on, I think we have to do tack w. I think it's for writing. Is it? No. Okay, let's try the absolute path instead of the relative path and see if that's gonna make a difference. So if we go user, sbin, Maybe? No, nope, permission denied. Hmm. We don't have to call, I always forget what the W is, right? Interesting. Oh, wait a sec. I think I know, I think I have. Yes, did that work? I think I just have to change the uh greater and lesser than sign. It's doing something. Okay, well, we do have a connection, so that's positive. <laughs> I don't think it's doing anything. Let's just quickly look net cat file transfer dash w. We could probably just do tack help, to be honest, because obviously this is just stuck here and probably not gonna do anything. So let's do net cat dash help. W is timeout for connects and final net reads. Final net reads. Okay, let's try it again. Let's do netcat. I know I often have to do this for machines on, oh, Von Hub. Okay, so I wasn't even listening. Let's see, did it actually get the SSHD file? Oh, apparently it worked, okay. Yeah, so you don't need to do dash W or anything, it just works. Awesome. Let's investigate this. Let's run strings on our new binary. It's too many, let's grep for password. Okay, well we got, uh, I mean, this looks good, look at that. We have, we have a lot actually, password authentication. MM auth password, MM answer auth. This is interesting. So a couple quick uh, tips here. We can use a command called object dump dash S dash J just to check the row data. We can obviously do this with Ghidra much quicker, but sometimes it's good to kind of play around a little bit and we'll go grep for auth. And you can see there's a lot of, that's not very helpful, grep for password. Not very helpful. We can do, let's go ahead and fire, open up GDP with our binary. Go info func. We're not gonna read, oh, no, we're not gonna read that many. Let's do vmap, virtual mapping, or no, info proc map, info proc map, I think. No current process, right? Makes sense. Can we do v? I don't think you can just run vmap. Well, you can, yeah. Oh, interesting. I guess, I don't know what I thought that was gonna do. We can't use the p command to check for anything because there's no process running. We can do, again, we can't do search mem either. Although I guess we can kind of do search mem, but there's nothing there. We could use rock gadgets, but I think what we're going to instead do is just, we saw those auths and pass, password auths, so we're just gonna fire up Ghidra 
and cut straight to it. Otherwise, we could do like break main, but I don't. Yeah, we can't. So there is no main. So this. Well, actually, hang on. Let's see. Maybe we just have to do sudo. I didn't actually check if there's a main function. But this doesn't look. Yeah, this didn't load peta when I did it as. Okay, let's just run Ghidra. We'll run G Hydra. Ghidra or G Hydra is just loading up here, but while it is, let's look for that auth password business. So if we search for, oh boy, we have a lot. Okay, what do we have? What do we have? We have, we have a lot. I guess I'll give it more time to load here because it's going to keep. So, okay, well, <laughs> If we look at exports auth password, we can immediately see that there is this back door over here. User auth none password, mm answer auth password. So this is suspicious, this backdoor business within the auth password function. This is hexadecimal data, so we should be able to decode this. So let's jump over to Cyberchef. Clear what we had before. And let's start copying I'm just trying to think how we would yeah I guess let's copy from I'm not sure we can just copy and paste it into here because it has to be in a certain order because it's it's uh it's a byte array and there's multiple arrays. We can see here it starts at 0, 04, goes to 44, 84, 12, 4, 16, 24, 28. And then we also have to remember, we're gonna have to swap the endianness because it's gonna be sent into the machine in a reverse format. So let's start with Swapping endianness. We'll copy this in here how we think to do it, and then we'll immediately decode from hex. Is that right? From yeah, from hex. Auto delimiter will be zero x. And yeah, I guess let's start. So let's copy zero four. Down to four four. You know what, maybe we'll do this. Yeah, this is fine actually. You know what, I'm gonna do this on separate lines just so it's easier to track, because I don't think this is gonna work. As we build this so-called back door. So this is kind of like the payload. And if we were to write a binary exploit or do a buffer overflow, we would have to pass the data in reverse format. So I'm not really seeing anything here as we decode, but we're not going to see anything until we have the perfect alignment of characters in this case. And then we have, I think I might, I think I actually did this the wrong way because I have a feeling that, I think I actually put this in backwards. So that's okay. Well, that's, I think I'll just finish then. So we, and then I think I actually have to reverse them all. And then which one, the final one is going to be 30, which is this one. Yeah. You can see that this is just, there's nothing. I, I'm not sure why this is a negative. I don't think that can work like that, but anyways, let's create some spaces. I'll flip all this. So I'm noticing on further contemplation that the way this has been passed to our actual byte array is that our, so if we look here, char backdoor 31 length type, it's not, I think what we actually have to do is pass it in the order we see here, which is starting with 28, going down to 24, 16, and then we do four, four, or four, zero, four, eight, 12. This is how we're actually going to pass it. And then this backdoor is defining our array size. So this would need to be called first. 
So let's jump back over here, work our way down the list, starting with 28. Yep, we have the characters that have address 24. Oops. Then at 16, and then it resets, and we start essentially at zero, where we have six, or the payload ending in six, the payload ending in three, ending in eight, and ending in seven. And we can chop all this off. However, it's going to get tricky now because we have this negative character up here. And word length and bytes. You see, I don't like this, this negative, that, uh, just that negative character there. From here, I just had to get some help on the forums. I was a little lost and I learned that if I actually right click on this, I can see it's specified as A5. So thinking I was very close, I went and changed this to A5 and I thought, okay, well, surely we should be getting close to our, our target here. However, I learned that there was actually the XOR function here, which was right here using a key of 96. So the natural inclination was, okay, let's add the XOR function right there. Put a key in of 96. And you can see we start to get some normalized material, but this still didn't work and I was so lost. So I then learned that I actually had to specify the data format at character length 31, because that's what we see up here, character backdoor. It's a 31 length word, it's all one word. It's just being passed um, as a payload here. And we had to put the zero XA5 to specify the byte length of this payload at the top and then this payload will actually get us access. So we would do SSH, SSHD to our target 10.129.82.170. Pass this password. Oh, permission denied. Let me just try that again. Perhaps it was root that we were SSH root straight, straight to the payload here, right for root. Let's pass the password. Nope, still didn't work. Ah, of course the issue is the pad incomplete word. So we take that off, now it'll work. Still nothing. Whoops, so I was just double checking everything and I actually had the wrong order here. So I'm supposed to have, the six is supposed to be at the bottom here or the payload ending with six, and then I'm reordering the payload and taking the, th the payload ending with three and just restructuring this payload. And then I'll just show you why that was wrong in a second here. If we just take a quick look at G Hydra, you can see here at the top, we've specified our backdoor array of 30 characters. Then we started with the memory address 28, gone down to 24, 16, and then from here we jump over to 12. Then we move to eight, so, so we continue down. I just, I was confused as to how this was being passed. I actually just had to pass the entire payload, starting at the top all the way to the bottom, and I'd overcomplicated it. So this password here shall work. There it is, we're in. Anyways, that's a wrap. Thanks everyone for tuning in and your patience getting through this machine. I'm excited to see how IPSEC solved this machine and others. Please comment down below if there's another way you solved this or if there's something I could have done a little differently. See everyone in the next video and happy hackboxing.